Excelentíssimo Senhor Presidente da Autoridade de Continência, caras e caros colegas, meus senhores e meus senhores, desejo começar por saudar esta iniciativa da Autoridade de Concorrência na ocasião de seu vigésimo aniversário, a agradecer o convite para participar esta conferência. Tendo atendido o limite do, dos meus conhecimentos da língua de Luís Vaz Camões, permitam-me me continuar em inglês. It took me a little effort. Thank you very much. <laughs> Happy birthday to the Portuguese uh, Competition Authority. 20 years, 20 years of a fully-fledged independent competition authority is indeed an important moment to mark. It coincides with the entry into force of Regulation 1-2003, which stimulated the growth and development of similar authorities and which basically led the foundations of what we know today as the European Competition Network. It will be this network which will be the say, the core of my presentation. But before doing so, I would like to come back to 2003, because it's an important date which marked the development of competition law in several respects. First, from a substantive point of view, uh, and I would like to mention two things. First, the direct effect of Article 101, Paragraph 3. Uh, now, judges can apply the exception to the prohibition uh, directly. But that's not only that. It's also the way how it was interpreted that changed uh, in 2003, or at least in 2004, when the Commission adopted the interpretative notice on Article 101, Paragraph 3, focused on a more economic approach. I will come back to that later. So that's the first development, I would say, the change of uh, 101, Paragraph 3. Then, and it was already mentioned by Olivier Gersel, the obligation to apply European competition law when national competition law applies and trade between member states is affected. So this alignment obligation between national law and European law, making it very difficult, for example, to understand where national competition law stops and where European competition law starts, or vice versa. It basically is competition law applied by a larger family. This brings me to the second important development which took place in 2003, which is related to the substance, which is the obligation to cooperate. But before saying so, this obligation to cooperate applies to national courts. Because if you have an obligation to align the application of national and European competition law, the question arises as to the interpretation of the concepts. Can the Court of Justice interpret national competition law even when there is no application of European competition law? The Court answered that question in positive terms in the T. Bombal case, which is a Dutch case involving Dutch competition law. But since the Dutch legislator had decided that the Dutch law should be interpreted in the same way as the European law, the Court of Justice accepted uh, to answer a question from a Dutch court on the interpretation of Dutch law. Uh, you see how far this goes. Uh, the European court interpreting national law. And sometimes, quite frankly, I don't know what type of law is applied. I refer to a recent case of the 26th of October, uh, in the EDP MCH case, which is a Portuguese case. Uh, we look at it from a substantive point of view uh, on this non-compete clause, but is it Portuguese competition law? Is it European competition law? Quite frankly, uh, you don't even ask yourself the question anymore. Uh, you focus directly on how the law has to be interpreted. So that's a major procedural development, uh, the, the fact that both sets of laws become the same thing. This obligation to cooperate between courts, uh, of course, applies to authorities. Uh, if you apply the same concepts, the authorities must cooperate. 
And that's basically what Regulation 1 2003 provides for. It provides for a platform, a dispatch platform, under Article 11, and to see which authority takes up which case, and say some kind of coordination mechanism in the hands of the European Commission. It also provides for mutual assistance and exchange of information between the authorities, and it is truly a network without saying so. Because if you have a look at Regulation 1 2003, I think it's only in one of the recitals that you will find the word network, but there is no reference whatsoever to the name European Competition Network. That only surfaces uh, with the ECN Plus Directive in 2019. So two major developments in 2003, from a substantive point of view and a procedural point of view. But what about merger control? Does the EECN have a role to play in merger control? There's no word in the merger control regulation on the ECN. But that's just the law. The practice might well be completely different. That brings me to the three themes which I would like to address in my presentation today. First, this point of substance. Um, and the question there on the conference dealing with law and economics is the question, are we still completely geared towards an effects-based approach, or is the pendulum of history going back in a certain sense? Question, which I would like to address. Secondly, the ECN is now a fully-fledged organization uh, with a name and a budget, but are there also obligations resting upon the ECN? especially in terms of judicial protection. And the third question is merger control. Does the ECN have a role to play in merger control? So I start with the evolution of the substantive law and the question about the effects-based approach. I hope uh, you will be with me if I go back in history, because if you go for the pendulum of history, you have to go back a while to see how it swings. So, if you allow me, I go back to the 1980s and 90s, the early 90s. It's the time of the internal market project. So the project 1992, the big internal market which would be created, um, it was a belief in market forces and in competition law. Uh, we see, for example, at that moment that national law develops spontaneously towards European law. You see, for example, I think it started with the French, uh, with an ordonnance in 1986, which aligned their law completely on articles, articles 85 and 86, as they were called at the time, which are now 101 and 102. And that development was followed in all member states. And basically, I think, for one reason or another, without the legislator saying so, uh, national competition law has been aligned on the European model with the idea it should be the same set of rules that apply in an integrated market. Um, and at the European level, the idea was to say, we must focus on the issues which really harm competition, hardcore restrictions and abuses of dominant position. So that was the mindset uh, at the time. That had an impact, for example, on the way Article 101 was interpreted. Uh, the exclusive right which the Commission still had at the time was a real obstacle to industry because, of course, the Commission could not face the duties it had in applying uh, the Article 85 or Article 181 paragraph 3 exemption. That was impossible. Uh, it led to stalemates in courts, in particular under vertical agreements and license agreements, and you see the Court of Justice gradually in the 1980s and 90s taking a more liberal stance towards the application of the prohibition. Only in exceptional cases, the prohibition kicks in. Um, I think the, the case culminating this development is the delimitis case of 1991, in which the Court said explicitly a non-compete clause is not necessarily a restriction of competition. It only becomes one if it has foreclosure effects. Uh, clearly an effects-based approach in the case law to avoid the trap of the exemption 
for which the Commission had an exclusive power. Um, the court also understood that it was a difficult provision to apply. Of course, this foreclosure test is not so easy to apply. It's economics. And you see Article 15 already, of Article 15 of Regulation 1, in the judgment, where the court says, ah, the Commission must help national courts when national courts have difficulties in applying a complex test. So that was the development of the case law at that time, and that was reflected in the 2004 interpretative notice on Article 101, Paragraph 3. A more flexible approach as regards the interpretation of the prohibition implies a more rigid approach as regards the possibilities to apply the exception. And it also means that you have a clear welfare standard when you apply the exception. Moreover, the advantages of those who are affected by the restrictive behavior should correspond to the benefits uh, when it comes to the application of the exception. A very strict standard. It basically means, at least to my knowledge, that Article 101, Paragraph 3 has become a dead letter. Lettre morte. I am not aware of any enforcement practice or any application of 101, Paragraph 3 by national competition authorities or by the European Commission. European Commission doesn't apply it, and national competition authorities cannot apply it because they don't have the power to do so under Article 5 of the regulation. So more flexibility under 101, Paragraph 1, but no enforcement practice whatsoever, or at least very modest one, in terms of exceptions uh, under Article 101, Paragraph 3. As regards Article 102, a similar development took place. Um, first, the Commission took this guidance paper, and as Olivier Garçon just said, it will evolve into real guidelines, because the form-based approach has also been, say, put aside by the Court of Justice in a series of judgments. It started with preliminary references from national courts, in particular in the application of national competition law, for example, the post-Denmark cases, a typical example of those cases. And it culminated in the Intel case of 2017, where the court clearly said that you should take a broader look at the markets, in particular ground 139. I'm looking at the reporting judge in the room. He will probably <laughs> remember uh, what I refer to. All this will lead now to new guidelines, as Olivier Gerson just mentioned. So both as regards the uh, interpretation of 101 and 102, a more effect-based approach. I think it does indeed lead to better informed decision-making in individual cases. But the question arises, and it was already alluded to also by Olivier Garçon, it's all very well, but what about the enforcement practice in general? Because if you have well-informed decision-making in individual cases, it's very complex. It takes up many resources. Uh, it leads to fewer decisions, perhaps better decisions, but fewer decisions. Is that still something we need? Uh, is that a question I ask myself? For example, uh, when I look at the docket of my court, I see very few cases coming in. Uh, and when they come in, they tend to be very complex, but also very fragile. Uh, for example, if you have an as efficient competitor test, yeah, you open the issue for legal debate. And it's not always to the Commission's advantage, as we have seen, for example, in Google Android and in the Intel 2 case. So the question I put to you, a question for debate, does this approach focusing on sophistication and effects, meets the requirements of the current age as regards the application of 101 paragraph 3, or, for example, the speed which is required when you speak about the digital markets, also an element to which the Director General referred. Just questions, I don't have answers. But I see already in the case law and in legal developments 
reactions to these questions. First, the object-effect discussion. I note, for example, in the case law of the court in particular, that more cases shift to the object box rather than the effect box. For example, we have a case like Generics UK, Allianz Hungary, or recently EDP MCH. It's object relieving the authorities from the obligation to assess whether there are effects. A second reaction, for example, is the reaction of some competition authorities to this limited approach under Article 101, Paragraph 3, when it comes to sustainability questions. Should the advantage accrue to the same consumers as those who are the victim of the restrictive practice? Here again, a question. And I note that some authorities have different views than the European Commission. And finally, there is the DMA. It's a form-based regulation, which in some respects is reminiscent of the old block exemption regulations of the early 80s. So that's what I wanted to say on the substance. Brings me to the second theme, which deals with procedure. I already mentioned the question of the preliminary references and the competence of the court as regards the interpretation of uh, national competition. No, I will not dwell upon that. I will focus immediately on the network itself. Um, Regulation 1 2003 is well known, can be short on this. Uh, I would say that Article 11 and Article 13 provide for a real dispatch platform and coordination platform. Article 11, who takes up the case? Article 13, rejection of complaints if somebody else is already dealing with the case. Quite exceptional as well are the exchange of information horizontally between the authorities provided for and Article 12 and 22 when it comes to exchange of information or inspections carried out for other authorities. And, and that's not in the regulation, many meetings. I'm always very much surprised by the fact that all members of ECN know each other, they meet each other, they exchange information, have conferences. It's an intellectual enforcement community. That's not in the regulation, but it might well be in the Directive 2019, paragraph 1, because Article 33 of the Directive provides for a budget to organize these type of exchanges. So it acknowledges the fact that it is a group which works together. The directive also enforces, or say reinforces the powers of the authorities in terms of inspection powers. I understand from President Cunha Rodriguez that there is still a wish list to be, <laughs> to be fulfilled, but nevertheless the directive is there. Reinforce cooperation in terms of information and mutual exchange horizontally. And finally, say the coordination of leniency regimes, time limits, access to file questions. So basically, the, what happens spontaneously as a form of harmoniz harmonization at the level of the substantive law has become an issue of procedural law as well, and now under the directives. So you see the network growing together. I think it's a success model. Uh, Quite frankly, who would have thought that 40 years ago or 20 years ago that it would evolve in that sense? Uh, that, for example, some authorities take up cases and inform the others. It's an organic thing which basically applies competition law uh, in a very efficient manner. However, <laughs> the directive also provides for obligations. First, the authorities must have sufficient resources the authorities should be independent. And last but not least, and that's where the courts kick in, fundamental rights have to be respected. And that creates the question as to how the judiciary can react to the ECN. It's a network. One authority takes up a case uh, instead of another authority. An authority, an authority is already dealing with the case, and the commission takes over. Uh, for example, as happened in the Silgan case. Or, for example, authorities decide to split the work. For example, the Amazon case between the Italian authority and the European Commission. The answers given by the General Court and on appeal, the Court of Justice, in my, my view, makes sense from 
a legal point of view, is to say, okay, this is work allocation and is only an issue when it comes to the final decision, and the final decision is being controlled by the judiciary of the member state of the competent authority. Nevertheless, you create several fora in which companies must defend themselves. I think it's compatible with fundamental rights, but nevertheless, it raises a practical issue, and sometimes it can give rise to fundamental rights questions. I would like to refer in this respect to a Polish case, the SPED Pro case, in which the Commission had rejected a complaint saying that the Polish authorities were better placed to deal with the case. The General Court didn't agree with that assessment. It said, okay, that might well be true what you say, but you have not answered to the specific concerns raised by the complainant before the Commission, which is that the complainants had doubts as to the independence of the Polish authority to deal with the case in this particular matter. It concerned behavior of a publicly owned Polish company. And the question was, could the Polish authority address that question in all independence? The Commission had not addressed the issue, and the General Court annulled the decision of the Commission rejecting the complaint because the Commission had not taken a stance on this particular point of view. But it shows huh, that when it comes to fundamental rights, the General Court, and I think also the Court of Justice, will control uh, the way uh, cases are being dealt with uh, by the ECN when fundamental rights get at stake. That was my observation on the procedural points. Now the last one on merger control. As I said in my introduction, nothing is said about the ECN in terms of merger control, which is perfectly normal because in 1989 the idea was to set up an exclusive system, a one-stop shop above the thresholds. And that would be the Commission's exclusive jurisdiction and sometimes member states didn't even have merger control. So the, there was no issue of concurring application as it arose, for example, uh, in the terms of uh, antitrust law. Um, you have clear uh, thresholds, and, and that was it. However, already from the beginning, it was not so clear-cut. You had exceptions to these threshold rules. Uh, the German clause, Article 9, and Article 22, the Dutch clause. Then in 2004, there was an erosion of the thresholds uh, with the new Article 2, uh, the 2.5 billion threshold, plus the possibility for the uh, parties, when you trigger three jurisdictions, to request uh, the Commission to take up the case. So you have, under the thresholds or with the threshold, a system of elevators which go, go up and down to the Commission or go, go back to the national courts, which necessarily required some kind of cooperation between the authorities at stake. And so already from its inception, it couldn't work without cooperation between authorities. This development, which was already uh, foreseen in 2004, has been accelerated recently uh, because the value of the thresholds, I would submit, as clear indicators of jurisdiction, has eroded a bit. I refer in particular to the revival of Article 22, the revival of the Dutch clause in the Illumina case, and the jurisdictional question is still pending before the Court of Justice, but the General Court validated the fact uh, that authorities can trigger Article 22 uh, in the situations, uh, for example, as in the Illumina case, when you are below the thresholds. Anticipating on the outcome of the Illumina case is Article 14 of the DMA, uh, which provides for an obligation on the parties to inform about transactions, even if they don't trigger the uh, thresholds. That means that thresholds lose a bit of their absolute value. Then there are new interventions under the foreign subsidies regulation. There again, uh, what will happen to those? Uh, they're clear thresholds, but there is also a provision that the Commission can take up cases ex officio. Again, limiting the value of the thresholds. 
And last but not least, we have a revival of continental can in the Tower Cast judgment, uh, which says that you can apply Article 102 below the thresholds. If you have a situation like that, where you have an application of 22, application of 102 below the threshold, it can only work if the ECN gets in. It's a system which becomes just as, say, administrative or organic, whatever you want to call it, as it is uh, under Article 101 and 102. So those were my three comments I wanted to make. First, uh, on the substance of the law, is the pendulum of history in terms of competition law going a bit back from the effects-based approach? Um, how will the ECN evolve? What's the judicial control which will evolve over time on the ECN as an organization? And thirdly, will the ECN growth in new areas, for example, like merger control, as it already does? And last but not least, the DMA, and that was also the point to which Olivier Gersan referred to in his, uh, in his speech, in particular Article 38 of the DMA, which provides for a clear obligation of the authorities to cooperate. So I think, Mr. President, that there is still a bit of work ahead for your organization, so that for the 40th anniversary there will be things to talk about. I thank you very much for your attention.